Hello and welcome to the Dao Yi podcast. I'm Robert Coons. Today with me here is Dr. Livia Cohn, one of the most, if not the most eminent and accomplished translators of Taoist manuscripts uh, in the Western world period. Um, today we are going to talk about many interesting subjects uh, related to Dr. Cohn's experience, which is fast. And so oh, this is a personal treat for me. Thank you very much for joining us, Dr. Cohn. Oh, well, thank you. I'll be very happy to be here. Yeah. Great. So uh, just getting into things. So you have been doing Taoist academics and also a lot of community community organizing for many, many years. And I just want to extend a personal thanks to you because I, uh, one of my earliest introductions to Taoism was actually by picking up some of the books that my father had bought that were written by you back when I was quite small. <laughs> so um, it was partly your influence that got me going down this crazy, really rewarding rabbit hole. So wow. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Wow. That's great. So may I ask you, um, let's just let's jump right into all the crazy stuff. What was it that, that drew you to researching Taoism? Um, I was interested in China, just, just to be, you know, like generically interested in Chinese things. And then I started to do Chinese studies in college. Um, and I was originally from Germany and I became an exchange student for University of California at Berkeley. And when I got there, um, Professor Edward Schaefer, who was really a specialist of poetry and Tang Dynasty literature, he was in his last year of teaching and he had discovered that he couldn't understand Tang poetry without really going deeply into Taoism. And so he was teaching Taoism. So I took his classes and that sort of set me off as this is a fascinating subject, and there's very little known about it, and it's um, a really rewarding field. That is really cool. I think Berkeley must have been the place to be. Um, so now, when you began studying Taoism, you've, you've since then you've done a lot of stuff, and uh, that's that's not an understatement to say that in terms of being prolific, I can't really think of anybody else who has been as prolific in Taoist studies of you as you have. And so you've spent a lot of time uh, not only in academe, but in in Asia, um, going to many, many different places, meeting with many different people. And uh, I think that when people engage in that kind of level of study, they can't help but coming out with um, with a worldview. And one of the things that fascinates me about Taoist studies is that there are so many worldviews. And specifically, I remember that you wrote a piece at one point where you said uh, Taoism, it's something to the effect that Taoism is not monolithic. There's a lot of different things going on in the Taoist world and that uh, it, you can't really peg it down into one place or time. And I know this is a bit general, but can you expand a little bit on that interesting view of Taoism, because sometimes people get a little bit into their own personal category, and it might be useful for our audience to see the big picture a little bit. Okay. Um, well, in, in, in many ways, see, people, um, you're, you're coming from a Western perspective, and then you look at this thing, Taoism, that's out there, and you sort of expect it to be this, you know, sort of nicely shaped, rounded, you know, clearly delineated kind of entity but I mean if you look at your own tradition you know say you're from a Christian tradition I mean there's so many different versions of Christianity and there's so many different sects and you know there's you know all these kinds of different branches and the same for Judaism and and a lot of like you know modern reformed Jews have very little to do with the Hasidic community and and there's so many different things there, there's certain things they have in common and so they all call themselves Jews or Christians but and so the same is true for Taoism so you have you know 2500 years of history and so you have a philosophical tradition, you have a clerical, liturgical, ritual tradition, you have the whole branches of bodily cultivation, internal meditations, and, and so different people, you know, focus on different aspects of the tradition, and 
we did have a whole conference in 1998 on the question of what does it mean to be a Taoist? What really is Taoist identity? And we had, you know, 20, 30 people, you know, high level scholars who really know the stuff from both East and West. And, and we discussed it right, left and center. And the discussion we ended up with the solution is like, you know, whoever calls himself Taoist is a Taoist. <laughs> I like it. Sort of like a Christian, right? Yeah, but you don't really have to, you know, have with Christians you usually have to have a faith of some sort, or you belong to a church, or you have, you know, and this with Taoists, it's like they can do anything and they think of themselves as Taoist, and that's what you know does it. Um so that said, um, I tend to think of Taoism as having three major branches of, of what we call literati tradition, which is more philosophical and abstract and where you think about things and where your whole way of looking at the world is influenced by Taoism. And then the more communal kind of Taoism where it's really a social organization with the priesthood and the, and the scriptures and the liturgies and where you have festivals in the course of the year and you have organizational structures and then a health dimension, which is the longevity practices, um, the internal cultivation, and, and so we do have, and we've had other conferences where, you know, modern Western Taoist practitioners were sort of at odds with each other because one was a liturgical Taoist and the other was more of a self-cultivation Taoist. And they said, no, you're not a Taoist, you're just doing Tai Chi. And it's like, yeah, I'm doing Tai Chi, but I still think of myself as a Taoist because, you know, as I'm doing my Tai Chi movements, the Tao gets activated in me. And the thing is, they're all right. I mean, you, you don't have to have everything, but it is a, it's, it's nice to know about the other dimensions. So, so you're not ignoring anything. That's great. And, and this, um, if you'll forgive my nerdiness, because this is one of the few chances I get to ask these kind of questions to people who know about these things. Um, as you mentioned, it, commonly, uh, I think a lot of people would agree with you that there are these three dimensions to, to Taoism, which are, you know, approximately literati or um, philosophical. There's a, a religious dimension, which is emphasizing liturgy and other types of similar practice. And there's this self-cultivation dimension, which is perhaps more focused on practical concerns of the, of the body and of the mind and spirit. And so I have this nagging question that's been gnawing at me for a long time because I always watch what people are, are saying and and uh, I can't be I can't help but be influenced by the different um different discussions in the community. And it's my opinion personally that uh although you can't trace a precise lineage of philosophical Taoism, let's say from Lao Tzu to Wang Bi to you know whoever the Chongchuan guys or whatever all the way to the 20th century, it still kind of behaves in the way that an intellectual tradition would behave over hundreds of years. And so I one of my arguments to my religious friends who who can't bear the possibility that there is an intellectual part of Taoism outside of religion is that, you know, we don't have to have a lineage to study philosophy. And I'm wondering, um, how do you how do you feel about that question, which which has been very prominent recently as to uh, whether it's legitimate to, uh, let's say, look back at this intellectual tradition and call it a singular philosophical school, or whether we have to do something else with it relative to the, this criticism that's been made by some of the members of the religious community. Um, the, the, the philosophical or literati tradition in Taoism really comes in two different levels, let's say. Um, and one of them is really a more intellectual tradition. It's very philosophical. It relates, those are people who are really trained in Confucianism or they may come out of Buddhist philosophy and then they engage with Taoism and they get involved with that. So they write the commentaries and it's a lot of abstract theoretical speculation. Um, 
and it's 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 highly eclectic. A lot of the poets come into that category. There's like the the seven sages of the bamboo grove, and then quite a few other um six dynasties poets, um, even some of the great Tang and Song poets who had a very heavy um influence from Taoism. I mean, their whole way of looking at the world is very Taoist, or even the artists like um landscape painters so when you're starting to look into the connection to the art um then that's where sort of the philosophical intellectual tradition takes um has its place and it's not really connected to a particular lineage it's quite eclectic and, and selective but then you also have um, a major philosophical dimension in the religion. So for one thing, I mean, the Celestial Masters, the first organized Taoist community in the second century, I mean, the Tao Te Ching was their holy text. And they chanted it and they based their precepts on it and they, they used it for ethical guidelines and for behavioral me measures. They had a major commentary to it. Um, and so they've been working with it all along, and that has continued. And you do have many religious Taoist figures who have written commentaries to the Tao Te Ching, to the Zhuangzi, um, to other early texts, and who have been strongly inspired by the philosophical um, dimension of things. So, so it's and and it's continued. It's it's not been static. You know the way these texts have been read in in both these levels have continued to unfold. Thank you for that. I I think that is a very good summary, and uh, it also helped to to open my thinking a little bit about that because I think I'd become a little bit stodgy recently. Um, I now one thing also that I'd like to add to that question is there's this very interesting category within Taoism of people who are doing self-cultivation, you know, whether, because there's so many different kinds, right? But whether we're talking about, let's say, Tao Yin or, um, you know, things like apophatic meditation, like sitting and forgetting or, you know, internal alchemy and so on. And within those uh, communities, one of the things that I think people notice quickly when they start reading is that um, a lot of the the traditions where, let's say, internal alchemy came from, um, people like Lu Dongbin or or Zhang Boduan, they were um, not necessarily Taoist priests when they uh, came right. upon those things that they became famous for. And it's always struck me as very interesting how there's an engagement between the community and then the, the Taoist religious tradition where they end up being the holders of that knowledge. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about how these how texts from diverse traditions end up in Daozang and how they come to be uh, represented within mm. the religion of Taoism. Mm. Yeah, yeah, we do have um, the, the Taoist canon does contain like medical texts and there's some philosophical texts and there's some materials that are from like, like, like Wei Guzi, who are not really, who's an ancient thinker, not all that well known, but who was not really technically Taoist. Um, sort of falls between the cracks. Um, uh, that has to do with the, the bibliographers in the Ming dynasty making decisions, you know, that, you know, certain groups of Taoists were also venerating these figures or some groups are really into medical practices. And so they decided to integrate those. Um, a lot of this is more bibliographic than it is um, doctrinal, let's say. Um, the other question that was in your in your remarks is that there are people who do not really um, follow a particular lineage. They do not follow a particular school. Um, they sort of stumble on things, you know. So, oh, you know, wow, you know, I'm trying to do this, and oh, this is what happens. And then they go around and they work with different people from often from very diverse traditions and then they create their own kind of system. And of course, in the beginning, they all looked at very, you know, suspiciously. It's like, oh, you know, this weird guy, you know, he's doing this strange stuff. But then it turns out that his method really has some results and there's a lot of discipline and there's a lot of good 
things happening and then people start to follow him and before you know it he becomes part of you know some kind of a lineage and then so it's essentially after the fact that he then gets linked to a certain deity or a certain immortal or a certain connection so he gets put into the lineage structure and that is very very common and that's still going on this is still happening today <laughs> it's one of the contentions we have sometimes where people require it's like you're not this again the question who is a Taoist you know you're not a Taoist unless you have a lineage but then okay you know what if I just continue to do these various practices and then all of a sudden I have followers and then oops you know I get connected to certain deities and you know, now I am in the lineage and I'm like yeah <laughs> so so there's a, a very strong dynamic there uh, for the tradition to renew itself and for individual people to come up with even like within the Qigong tradition you get people you know creating new forms of Qigong that are quite effect effective, and then then they become their masters in their own right. That's wonderful. Um, I, I now I have another another uh, question. It's a little bit of a divergence from what we just talked about, but um, it also does speak to some of this stuff. One thing that's interesting to think about in relation to Taoist studies and Taoist practice is how we. Uh, understand the particular aspirations and goals of uh different practitioners let's yeah. even outside of ourselves uh and if we look at his historical Taoism there's a very diverse discussion about even um what the Tao is uh how we should embody it uh what kind of steps we need to do to return to it or to to um let's say bring the benefits of it into ourselves and into the world and it can be a very mixed up place because um, everybody looks at different sources. So the question is, do you think that it's possible even that there is a shared conception of the goals and uh, sort of end game of Taoist studies? Or is it something that's just like blown open and there's a million different ways to do it? Um, no, there there is an underlying um, there's there's an underlying consensus, an underlying community, an underlying structure that that goes all the way through, no matter what kind of Taoism it is, and what kind of practices, and what kind of goals. Um, Taoism is always always about relating to the universe. It's not just about your body. It's not just about the society. It's not just about culture. It's not just about a specific deity. It's relating to the greater universe. And so you're, you're reorganizing your body because you want the universe to have the chi, the primordial energy of the universe, the pure powers of Tao to start flowing in you. You're creating a community because you're developing these same kinds of open flows and and social interactions that replicate certain patterns in the heavens and among the immortals. Um, you take certain herbs or certain things because they have a concentrated form of universal power and energy there. Um, but within that framework, you then have a large variety and it, it's very individually focused. So, I mean, some people, um, are more physically oriented and you know they like to be moving so they should be doing more Tao Yin exercises um, some people are more into you know still have health issues they may have to reorganize their themselves on a dietary level but whatever it is that you do it moves it it, it allows the universe to play in your life essentially that's what they're after so this is um there's an interesting discussion that's been going on very, very recently. Now that the online discourse about Taoism is getting more robust and more healthy than it used to Good. be. And the an interesting discussion that's been happening is in relation to how we understand the the topics of nature and life or nature and destiny, right? We would say yeah. Xing and Ming, right? Xing Ming, okay. Yeah. And so in that regard, one of the arguments that I've heard happening recently in a very polite way, but it's a it's a civilized argument that's happening in the community, is to what extent we should view qi, 
as like a phenomenal thing, let's say post heaven or 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 pre heaven chi as as a a phenomenal phenomenological aspect of reality uh, as something that we cultivate. And recently, I've heard some people say that instead of viewing Ming or life energy as being related to the the nature of chi in our bodies, we should view it instead as sort of uh, all of the collected possible outcomes of our lives. And so instead, what they're saying is, you know, if you cultivate chi as a Taoist practitioner, um, you're kind of missing the point of returning back to this this wuji state or this sort of pole of non-being that that generates uh, all of being. And I, I've heard another argument, which is that people say, well, you should follow this other model, um, which I think is called um, shen xin zhu miao, like the body and heart are held together in the in 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 like a subtle way or a mysterious way and and so i think that's a very old uh discussion that's been happening in taoism do you cultivate your body and become an ascended person or do you cultivate your your mind or your spirit only and i'm wondering if you have any thoughts about that that problem because it seems like a very old debate which has just suddenly become important again in in the west somehow um, it's a it's a debate that that was part of the um, there are different schools within internal alchemy Xing and Ming, and the Xing is the internal or inner inner nature inborn nature your original disposition is the more psychological perspective, and Ming, which is often translated destiny or life or something, was understood as the more physical aspect of things and there is a split there and different some said you have to start with one and then you all move into the other and then vice versa um that's a nadan that in, in internal alchemy a particular schism within internal alchemy um in the tradition before that the two really belong together um and you cultivate in cooperation with both. And so your, your chi flows from the universe into you in the way I see it, two different ways. Um, it shows up on the internal level, which would be the xing, the inner nature level, as the certain things that we would call um, internal tendencies, um, talents, things that are attractive to you, um, you know, so sort of, um, I do have a talk somewhere where I, I have a, a slide on, on Xing, and I have uh, three babies in this slide. And each baby has like, there's a teddy bear on one side and you have the three babies and one baby smiles at the teddy bear and the second baby is like, ah, for the board. And the third baby breaks out crying. <laughs> and that's your Xing. I mean, it's like, you know, it has nothing to do with the teddy bear. It has all to do with what is going on with inside of you. Um, and so, you know, like, um, like I have this, when I was um, in high school, my, my best friends in high school, her sister, her absolute unbelievable, I mean, the thing she was dreaming of in life was to be a dental hygienist. And I'm like, really? I mean, this couldn't be further from me, but that was for her. And that's her shing. It's like you're, you're the Tao flows into you and it comes out into certain talents, into certain abilities you have. Some people have a knack for certain things and then things that are attractive to you. And then, and so you, so you sort of work with that. But then the other part is on the Ming side is like what I call, I call my translation of Ming is circumstantial trajectories. It's what's going on in your environment. What is the family you're born into? What is the state, the, um, you know, the climate, the culture, 
what kind of schooling opportunities you have and what sort of opportunities come your way. So the universe sort of offers you things and then you can either say, no, thank you. Or you can sort of try and play around with them a little bit, or you can actually, oh yeah, look at that. And you can engage with them. And it's that Xing and Ming, they have to interact. I mean, the life brings you the opportunity to say whatever, you know, your school offers a class in drawing and it's like, oh my God, no, I don't want to touch a pen. You know, I'm much more of a ball player. And then, you know, here's a Ming that's offered to you, but you say, no, thank you. Or you say, you know what, you know, let me just see what comes out of this and let me try it. And, and so the Qi just flows in these different undulations. Um, and, and the other part is to this is that Taoists say that, you know, when the student is ready, the teachers will appear. And so you just start to say, you know what, I'd really like to engage in some kind of Taoist cultivation. And oops, you know, there's a Qigong class or there's something on Zoom or here's my friend who's doing something. And so things will start to to um, to manifest. And your your internal intention is sort of the key factor that creates direction in this pattern. And of course, the other saying is that, you know, where the mind goes, the chi will follow. So, so your intention sets you in a certain direction and then the chi, your own chi and also the chi of the universe will start to move. Um, so, so it all sort of, it's a, it's, a, it's a dance. It's a yin yang, in and out flowing kind of dance. I had never uh, conceptualized of Xing and Ming in that particular way. So I want to thank you very much for continuing to uh, open up entire new vistas for, for myself and I think for the <laughs> listeners too. Um, that is, that's a really interesting idea. And if it's okay, I want to, I want to um, dig through it a bit more. Um, so in this conception, um, in modern, so in modern Chinese language, if people talk about Xing, um, often they'll use it to talk about basically like a person's predilections or, or their personality. Um, Ming is a weird word in modern Chinese. You don't see it used by itself very much, right? You mm -hmm. see like, like Ming Yun or destiny, but people don't use that as much. But if we look at a person's sort of their... Ming, Ming Yun or Qian Ming. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. Ming Yun. Yeah. 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 And so if we think about then Xing as sort of being like a person's uh, predilections or what, what they have a tendency to being like, or even their personality. Um, when, when we look at uh, Taoist studies, I think it's almost uh, unquestionably true that different people have brought different aspects of themselves into the study of Taoism. Inevitably. Right. And so when, it's interesting to look back. Uh, I know that you are a great expert in the in the Yellow Court Classic and Huang Tingjing, and that uh, when we look at this this uh, genre or that generation of Taoism, uh, we see stuff that we see almost nowhere else. Right, Shangqing uh, practices were really really unique and special, and I wonder um, when you look at this material that's dealing a lot with the embodiment of deities in the body. Um, one of the questions that I think should come up for modern practitioners is whether we should try to understand and replicate what the people during that generation were doing, or whether perhaps we should, you know, march over to Malaysia and, you know, figure out what they're doing with the, the, the embodiment of deities and exorcism and, and that kind of thing or whether maybe we should view it as something that we can practice as a kind of qigong or even modify. And I'm wondering what your position on um, those very, very old practices uh, is, because this is something that I think uh, flummoxes many, many, many of us in the Taoist community. That is very true. Um, we, we do have many different kinds of Taoist meditation. Um... You mentioned the sitting in forgetfulness or oblivion earlier, which is just like, you know, you're just letting go, you're relaxing the self. And, and that's something that people usually can relate to. It's like, okay, you know, I'll just sort of forget all everything and just sort of be this blank slate for a little while and then new things can come in. Um, we do have um, concentration type meditation where people focus on the breath 
or focus on a single object. And, and that is another thing that people can relate to because it's like, you know, it concentrates your mind, it sharpens your mental facilities. Um, so those are relatively acceptable. And then also Buddhist and Hindu traditions have similar things. They're chanting traditions like in India. Um, when it comes to the body gods, it gets a little alien. It's like, okay, well, why would I really go about to see like a little baby dressed in a green hat in my liver? I mean, that is like weird. <laughs> um, and I used to think of these body gods as like, like mythological manifestations or mythological versions of the pure idea of spirit. Spirit is like the purest form of chi. It connects to the origins of the universe. It flows through people, but it tends to get sort of shadowed over by other activities and emotions and other mental things. Um, so, so allowing the spirit to sort of shine forth and to it's, it's, it's so amorphous and so abstract and so cosmic that, you know, the Taoists are like, okay, you know, we'll just visualize it as some kind of an entity. Um, and, and that is certainly um, true. Uh, more recently, I've discovered um, something that Western scientists are just about getting into. And it's the idea that human beings have light in their bodies. And it's um, light are photons, the particles are photon particles. And the light in the body is called biophotons. And it's really like the brink of modern physics research. And they finally developed uh, measurement devices that will measure just how many photons, what kind of light is being emitted from people. It's very light and it's, it's very subtle. I mean, this is not like you're shining force, like, you know, like a light bulb. Um, it's, it's, I think the comparison was looking at a, a light of a candle about 15 miles away. So with your ordinary eyesight, you can't see it. Um, but those photons exist and they do things. And what's interesting is that the what Western scientists say about biophotons is exactly what the Chinese have or Taoists have been saying about qi and these spirit manifestations in the body is that you need to keep them in the body and they don't have to be a lot of them. You don't want a high intensity but you do want a high degree of coherence. Coherence is what makes the difference. And so they now start, started to use biophoton technology for diagnosis and they can go over the skin and they can see where there is like a cancer cell and cancer cells biophoton signature is significantly different from that of healthy tissue. It looks different and it's not as coherent. So you want an internal light pattern that is coherent and fluid and moves along and has an exchange to the outside world. So there's quite a bit of Taoist practice where you're absorbing the sun, you're absorbing the essence, the energy of the moon, um, you're connecting to the stars, to the starlight, and then you're also visualizing those entities inside the body. And so working with these lights is just fascinating. And that is something that I think Western practice or practitioners, modern practitioners should pay more attention to. And it's not particularly difficult. I mean, you can, you know, close your eyes and take a few deep breaths and then start to see like a light radiating in your heart and allow that light to spread through the body and to see your whole body shimmering in this vibrant oscillating light and let it smoothly flow in you and around you like an aura they have aura photography which is curly on photography and aura pictures which is similar to that and you can create um, a, a very high level of health and coherence and and you know increasingly spiritual states by increasing 
the coherence of the light flow in the body. And so those gods that the highest clarity Shang Ching practitioners were working with are really just little sparks. And that's how they talk about it. You know, the gods are like these strings of pearls, like stars that are hanging and they're lighting up and they're radiating. And, and I've been translating the yellow cord scripture. And what, what turned me onto this whole thing was that I ran out of words for light. I had to go to a thesaurus and say, what else can I say? You know, radiant, shining, brilliant, fiery, flaming. I mean, there's like 22 different words for light in this thing. <laughs> it's like something's going on here. And then I started to read up on biophotons and it's like, aha. So I, I find it fascinating, and I think it's a dimension of practice that should be more encouraged. Yeah, and something that you also mentioned uh, was that there's this interesting practice of following lights that are actually radiating from the environment, and so yes. um, you know, sunlight or starlight or moonlight, and uh, a very fascinating rabbit hole, which. You know, potentially, I think this is talked about a lot in internal alchemy, but potentially in these other schools, is following the um, where the lights are during different times of the year. So, for instance, around the phases of the moon or um, yes. the solstices, and and I'm wondering um, in relation to that, because I've always wondered, like, why is it that during the full moon we have so much more abundant chi when we practice, or you know, around mm -hmm. the solstices. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if that has some sort of, uh, I know that we can't take too many steps into into um, material science because if, if we don't have the data with us, but I'm wondering if you can maybe elaborate on your take on um, why these different things might happen when the nature of the light changes in the environment. Well, it's, it's like, well, it's part of the... Um... The, the whole universe, whether you look at it from the Taoist perspective or from the modern quantum science perspective, it's energies that are closely interrelated. And so as you have different phases of the moon and different the le level of um, cloudiness and different like summer sun versus winter sun and different types of stars and constellations, there's an effect that um, that hits us as individual people. And so we are closely interrelated um, with everything that's going on. And so Taoists um, tend to be more aware of this than modern, than other people traditionally, and also than ordinary modern people. Um, and they tend to balance it out. It, it's always about balance and harmony. So, so if there's too much of it, you sort of want to, you know, take, lay back a little bit and, and ease it off. And if there's not enough light, then you want to increase it. And so, so your practices tend to always be related to what's going on in the outside world and in nature. And because we as human beings, being you know flesh and bones and energies were intimately connected with what's going on isn't it nice to uh be a little bit more in touch with nature yes it's wonderful it is so nice one of the one of the wonderful things about about taoism that uh i think that they have done uh very very well and perhaps we can include ourselves in it as well and we can all uh give all of the, the wonderful ancestral teachers a, a pat on the back. Absolutely. For allowing us to to be able to do the, these wonderful things. Um now in a on a more on a less you know theoretical note and and a very pragmatic note, I believe that you are doing a lecture series that is something that people should definitely check out if they're interested in Taoism. And could you please introduce um, what it's called, what it's about, and where we can see it? And of course, we'll link to it as well. Good. Yes. Yeah, so um, thank you for bringing that up. Um, it was um, about a year and a half ago, um, I decided to start this uh, online lecture series. Um, it's a Zoom series. It's every two weeks. The lectures are about 50 minutes, and then there's opportunity for questions. They're also recorded. They do happen on Thursdays, every second, it's usually every second and fourth 
Thursday of the month. And they're at 2, uh, 2 p.m. in the afternoon Eastern time. Um, having said that, <laughs> the next lecture is on the fifth Thursday because I'm going to be on an airplane on the fourth Thursday. Um, and it won't be at two, it'll be a little bit later because by that time I'll be in Japan. So there are a little bit oddities there, but I usually let people know ahead of time and the lectures are recorded. And then within a few, maybe 10 minutes after the end of the session, I will send out a link to the lecture so people can listen to them at any odd time. And the topics vary a great deal. Um, we were talking last time about um, how Buddhism relates to Taoism. Uh, we will talk more about those um, body lights that we were just mentioning next time because that's like my most recent research project. Um, there is going to be a whole talk on destiny actually is the second one after which would be um, April 13th, I believe. And then we've had talks on, on poetry, we've had talks on ecology, we've had talks on different philosophical topics. Um, we've had a talk about the early hagiography and biography of Lao Tzu. Um, we've talked about specific deities. Um, there are all the different practices. We've had talks on diet and on um, rituals. So, so there's, there's a large variety out there. I do have um, a, a little summary, complete list of them with little summaries. And um, the lecture series is called Tao Explore. So we're exploring Taoism from different dimensions. The subscription is $20 a month. And um, the way to subscribe is to go to the website of the publishing company I run, which is called Three Pines Press. So that's the number three and then the pine tree. Press, threepintspress.com. And if you go to that website, you'll see one of the headers is Dow Explore. And then you can um, click on that and you can subscribe. And you, I'd be very happy to have you. And then if you actually make it on the time, then it'll be great because there, there are usually about 10 people who participate um, actively. And we have a nice discussion usually. That's brilliant. Well, I'm looking forward to it. And uh... I think this is a great idea for anybody uh, who's in the community who's interested, whether they are um, totally new to the community or whether they've been doing it for 40 years, because right. there is no question that um, you're doing neat stuff and have always <laughs> been doing neat stuff. So uh, although I would never begrudge anybody the desire to become a dental hygienist, I'm glad that, <laughs> I'm glad that your nature... Uh, has has sort of pushed you toward entering into what, what you're doing. Um, <laughs> now, to be fair, perhaps she's the very best dental hygienist. So yeah, I, I don't even know if she ever made it to be a dental hygienist, but in high school, that's what she wanted to be. But um, also, people who are subscribers can suggest topics, and I've had a number of people do that. And and there was one person who wanted to know about death and the afterlife in Taoism. And I had never actually, I mean, I thought about it and I'd known about it, but I haven't actually had a presentation on it. So I sat down and started to do that and realized that the topic was much too big. So I had one on death and another one on the afterlife. And then also people, um, if they want to, they can contact me and I can send them links to previous lectures also. That's awesome. And and so if they see the one on the afterlife, then they won't be perplexed if they go to small town China and see people burning money in the street. <laughs> that's exactly right. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Well, thank you very, very much, Livia. This is this has been wonderful, and um, I would like to keep you for days and weeks and months to continue asking <laughs> you questions because uh, it's it's very, very educational for me. And uh, and so uh, one of the nice things about doing these interviews is that uh, I, I walk away from them feeling genuinely ed edified. And uh, this is perhaps the most edifying interview that has happened so far. Um, please do stick around for just a minute. I'm just going to um, finish okay. up and then I'll, I'll turn off the recording. Um, so everybody, th thank you very much for tuning in. Um, we will be putting the appropriate links in uh, the blog as well as in the comment on in the description of the video. And uh, you you know where to go, uh, uh, you, and you must go there. That's that's my official stance. So um, 
please check it out. And of course, uh, do check out uh, Dr. Cohn's uh, publishing company, Three Pines, Three Pines Press, right? Mm -hmm. it, there is a lot of good books there. And it's um, many, many different authors coming from many perspectives. Some of them are more academic. Some of them are more practice oriented. Mm -hmm. um, and there are other things that are at every shade of in between. So uh, thank you again, Dr. Cohn, and I will uh, just wrap it up right now, and then we'll just talk for a sec. So okay. everyone, see you in the next one.